Hi, and welcome back um, to the podcast. I have someone that I'm really excited to introduce. Um, he's tuning in from all the way over in, he's, he is in San Diego, but he's in a hotel um, somewhere not too far away from it. He'll remind me again in a minute. It's Andrew Fitzgerald, um, really, really inspiring individual, I suppose. I read his book, if you haven't read it, I'll, I'll put the link underneath um, to get it on Amazon or any of those places to get your books. It's really, really good. Um, how did I get here? I read the book and we're just going to delve into what the book is all about today with Andrew um, and a little bit about his journey because Andrew has had um, a lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of forwards and a lot of backwards um, to lead him to where he is today, living over across the waters in the States with his wife and his son. So Andrew, thanks so much for joining me. Can you refresh my memory where you said, you said Silicon Valley, I don't know if you said the location, you might have said it. <laughs> yeah, hey, thanks for ha having me on, Louise. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, so I do live in San Diego for the last 12 years from Cork originally. And today I'm in San Jose, which is in Silicon Valley in Northern California, as I'm visiting one of uh, a very good customer of mine later today. But delighted to chat with you and uh, see where our conversation goes. Thanks so much, um, Andrew. So the, the book, um, Travelling the Road to Resilience, um, really, really interesting. And when I, was, when I was reading it, I did mark down certain pieces of it because as an Irish person reading it, and we'll all take different things away from it, um, I just found it so, so interesting. Um, I'm just going to I'm just going to read out now you have to buy the book so you won't get me reading all the book um, to everyone here today okay just an FYI um but I'm just going to read a little a little portion here um and and I'm going to do that throughout the book or just pick up little bits that stood out to me um immigration in Ireland is and always has been seen as they had to go and there's nothing for them in Ireland which wasn't what I was doing. I was choosing to change my life, to follow an ambition. I didn't feel I had to explain why I was doing it. Truly no economic family or social circumstance was making me do it. And I read that little snippet before we go into the other parts of the book because I think most people in Ireland have heard that. <laughs> you must be leaving because there's something wrong. What's wrong with you? <laughs> What's wrong? What can we do to fix it to make you stay? Um, and it's just really interesting. And, and from a personal perspective, I can relate to this as well. I didn't move that far away. I stayed on the island of Ireland. But I remember leaving Galway and it was kind of like, well, what would you be leaving Galway for? And I'm kind of going uh, for career opportunities um, because I couldn't get them in Galway, you know, mm -hmm. for the sector I was in. It just wasn't there. And I wanted to grow and I wanted to move up the ladder. And that's why I relocated. But, you know, but there's nothing wrong. Sure, not your grand staying in the job you've in. She have a house and everything. So why would you go? She have no one to support you. So I just loved reading that. And it's really interesting, um, Andrew, because in your book, a lot of what you talk about around, you know, having that mindset, you know, the, the I suppose the, the negative self-talk, um, you know, that we don't realize we're kind of conditioned to doing. And I think you moving over to the States and I think you mentioned that everything was awesome. You know, that song, everything is awesome. Um, made me really rethink back to this because when I read this little scripture, this little paragraph, it really, I suppose, goes back to, well, why do we think that way? You know, why, why do we think there's something wrong in order for us to change? Because this is really about change, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you want to change, you want to move somewhere else. But as an Irish person, we immediately go, well, why do you want to change? There must be something wrong. And I think you touch on that a lot in the book and it really hones. When I listened to all the little bits, it came back to that kind of mindset thing that you had that when things weren't working out, Andrew, like that paragraph, I shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have made the change. I should have moved back. And um, talk to me about that because you know you talk in the book how you you know and I've so much to talk about. I could probably be here all day, so I'm going to try and keep it short. Um, you went to therapy. You know, you you found how to communicate a little bit more with your wife and things that were going on. But that whole change piece that you talk about at the beginning of the book, um, 
what 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 have you noticed now reflecting back on thinking about what I just read there that you know there must be something wrong to move and how that might have stayed with you and then you talked about going through customs in the airport and they were watching this thing on the telly and it must have been a fail Mary and it was really really funny reading it because I'd be going looking for those negative signs to yes, literally yeah. you know to go actually I'm validating that 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 inner that inner critic voice that's going on that's telling me everything isn't going to work out. So how did you go about silencing it? Yeah, I think first of all, uh, nicely synopsized and summed up, and that's a good one to to pick on. Definitely, you know, we culturally we grew up in smaller communities in Ireland. It's a small country, so we we tend to be very deep and uh, deep rooted cousins, aunts, uncles, friends, the pub Friday night. GA rugby soccer which is fantastic I mean I have yeah. to say Ireland is much more personable than America but I guess America is probably a little bit more leans to more positive and what if we try something different so I guess you know I've placed too much importance in other people's opinions rather than being true to myself and you know what's right for me is not always right for other people and as I look back now that's exactly how I live my life you know this is the right thing for me and um, you know I don't go around judging people as best I can of course you know we all have opinions mm -hmm. But I guess, you know, I did have to go and get some help. And you mentioned it. The therapist, counsellor, uh, Valerie, she was a great lady. She got me to do look at things totally different. So cognitive behavioural therapy. Look at my situation differently, reframe things. And then one thing she always stuck with me was, you're very resilient. And I never thought that about myself, you know. And we all are, of course. We do have the power of resilience within us. And we don't think back to times we've overcome struggles and, and tough times but when we left like there was we felt there was a burden and an expectation you know so mm -hmm. it was almost like this is going to work no matter what like you know and it was oh my god hail mary i hope everything works out you know and that's a generational thing too you know my mm -hmm. parents are in their 80s but um emigration is tough you know it can be a great adventure too though you know people think it's a sad time it's not you know you're going living your life mm -hmm. the world is smaller it's not like it was back in the 60s or 70s but i i, I have to continue to to um work on that stuff too you know in my situations in my corporate life reframe things but in a personal life there was like yeah this has got to work you know so then when we made the decision to move back which we did temporarily you know I guess when we went again people were saying you're mad it didn't work the first time you're too old now you know and I was like oh, no not at all I mean if anything we're going to go again not to prove something but because we, we don't want to regret things later in life I loved that um, and and you know what there's there's a lot of learnings to take but what I loved the most from that whole book um Andrew um is the fact that you were so vulnerable in that you moved back to Ireland mm. because it didn't work out mm. and you know what you said I'm going to go back you moved back to Ireland got your jobs you you went working for another brand Musgraves and and um your wife got back into the job that she had previously and reading that I was going wow and then to actually have the gumption and the and to have the courage I would say because it's really mm. courageous to actually get up and go back to the states again having moved home said it didn't work out but then on reflection going do you know what I don't think we gave it her all and I think yeah. that, you know what, if we gave it our all and we moved back to Ireland then because it didn't work out with this, with relocating to the States, then, okay, I, I'd be able to live with that. But you know what? We didn't give it our all. I'm not really happy with how we can we can do better. And um, why not give it another shot? And I just think that is so applicable to so many areas of our life that I think there is a little bit of shame, I think, sometimes that, you know, if something doesn't work, work out and we walk away and it could be, it could be anything, Andrew, it could mm -hmm. be a deal, mm -hmm. it could be a relationship, it could be something, you know, in any area of our life that there is this kind of shame that we're going back to it again. Um, and I think, you know, there's so much strength and power within going back to that again, knowing what you know now, what would you do differently, you know, and, and going in with that mindset. So, can you talk me through that? Because I, I just think that's something that, and, and I suppose I talk to a lot of people and I do a lot of coaching and I think there's there's so much there's so much courage in that, in, in going back and doing that. Talk me through that, I suppose, kind of, you you did tell, you did talk in the book how 
you did get a little bit depressed. You were kind mm. of threatened to meet friends and you'd never done that before. And, you know, how you, you had a love for golf and that definitely sings through in the book. You know, the golfing is a love of yours. Um, and that you kind of stopped doing that and, and doing things you enjoyed doing and, and feeling fulfilled because you you had this piece of regret inside you because it hadn't worked out in the States and you were mm. back in Ireland. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think it was like a retreat, not just moving back from America to Ireland, but it was like I retreated from what I felt was the norm of things that I did. Yeah, I was I was de- depressed, you know, I could say I was yeah. down, depressed. Yeah, I was, you know, when you stop playing your usual activities or you stop hanging around with your mates that you've known for years, I, I felt that I had to explain everything, you know. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, what I found tough was people not asking questions because then, you know, they don't want it, you know, they're gonna, they don't know what to say either, you know, much prefer someone to to meet it head on and say, oh, you know, what happened or talk about things, whatever. But I think that, you know, it's for everybody, be it business or a personal change in life, you have to kind of go back to why you wanted to move in the first place. You've got to remember that or make a change in, in a career, move house, move jobs, um, start a relationship or end a relationship, hopefully not ending too many of them. And, you know, go back to your values, you know. So for me, it was adventure. And my wife, Jane, too, of course, so she's in this very much, too, you know, so she's courageous. But we were moving for adventure, you know, and we we thought that it was the right thing for us. And uh, as you said, there was no social or economic circumstance making us move. It was something that we hadn't done, a lot of traveling. We had this opportunity, so why not go for it? And I think that as time has gone on, the culture and the environment I'm in now, although Ireland is always home, everywhere I go, it's it's infectious. It's what if we try this, Andrew? What if we were to do this rather than why didn't we think of doing this? So like, it's almost like playing out scenarios. What if I was to become a coach? What if I was to start a podcast? Yeah. What would that do for me? And, and and why would I be doing it? And and what do I want it to stand for? You know, so, I mean, we do, it, look, life is short. We all say that, of course. And I had a health scare, you know, as a, as a teenager. So I, I'm sure that shaped my life at some stage. Mm-hmm. However, you know, that scene in the book of us coming back and landing in Shannon, we knew straight away that it was a little bit of a regret. And then, you know, we went back to normal and jobs and all the things that everybody needs mm. and wants. And we were watching a late, late show on the Friday night, which is fine. But it was, you know, I don't think we gave ourselves the best chance. So we went back again. Yeah. Packed the bags, did everything again. And, and we're here now 12 years later. And uh, we do go back to Ireland every year for a couple of weeks holiday. And we get people to visit too. But, you know, life is still an ongoing journey, you know, I mean, now we're parents here, so that's new in America. So that's a change and adjustment. So now we have to remember, you know, what's right for us and define our family values. And uh, maybe America is the right place for, or maybe it's not, we don't know, you know, we're just taking it day by day, week by week. Um, But the, 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 the small community thing is great, like, but it's when you step out of yourself a little bit and you know, why shouldn't you aspire to chase your own dreams, whatever they are? I mean, I'm not going to judge somebody to say that that's crazy or not crazy. You you get a couple of chances at doing these things, so we should all go for them. And But I, the big thing was then you need to surround people to, to go on a journey with you. So, you know, Jane and I never spoke to anyone. You know, we could have leaned on some Irish people living in San Diego, you know, an expat community, and yeah. uh, we didn't. It was very strange. We retreated, and it was like, oh, you know, we should have figured this out a bit better, and too hard on each other but equally we should have given each other a kick in the butt and said come on let's stick this out and then when we, when we came back the second time we had an agreement we said look you know if one of us is not getting on well then we give it six more months and then we'll see where we're at and it's worked beautifully for both of us albeit ups and downs but that's life for everybody but anyone listening yeah if you have something that you want to go after and chase or you want to pivot your career or you're starting out of college or maybe you're later in life you want to write a book why not why would you not go and do these things and have confidence that it'll work out what's the worst that can happen you go to start to write a book you don't finish it you get there eventually you change yeah. jobs you can always change again you know i know there's it's tough economically and all that good stuff but you have one life you have to go after everything you want to do and enjoy it and embrace it as best you can and when you have downs surround people you know when you have tough times and talk about them and when you have ups celebrate you know don't don't expect to to um, you know, launch a podcast. Give yourself a pat on the back. Don't write a book I, I, without celebrating when it comes out, or or you know, whatever it is, you have to celebrate. Yeah, your I suppose you talked there about I suppose your your kind of your why for mm. for being there and um, is important, Andrew. And you know, in the book, you know, you mentioned that you'd 
visited the States, he visited San Diego um, prior to moving over there. The weather was a massive pull, obviously, and the fact I could golf more with the weather being really good. <laughs> um, and obviously um, living somewhere different, but has that why changed or is, the, is that why, has it stayed the same or has it evolved over time? Um, I would say it, it's constantly evolving. I'm very lucky I get to do some traveling. Every yeah. day I meet somebody new. Yeah. Every day I meet some new culture, diversity. I try yeah. new food. Um, it, the sense of adventure is still here. Um, yeah. And again, it's, it's, but it's, it is a little different. Now we're parents, so now we're settling into schooling and all that good stuff too. So that can be challenging, but equally um, enjoyable. But no, absolutely not. No, I, I, like <clears throat> we still very young like we're mid 40s but we feel like so here's the best way i can sum it up so i lived in ireland for 33 years and i lived in america for 12 years so i'm always going to lean back to the familiar which is always ireland of course but it's like this is like a, a part two of a life you know 12 yeah. years and discovering things every day and asking questions i mean i i, I work in sales so i ask a lot of questions but i never could ask questions when i meet people out in the street because you kind of knew everyone in cork and but now mm -hmm. hey tell me more about that and you know do a lot of listening and americans are very open um, yeah. and that's something that but yeah no it's great still sense of adventure still so many things to do um every day is a blessing yeah absolutely love it love it adventure and i'm, I'm hearing that word said a few times <laughs> yeah. so it's that sense of adventure it's really really nice um to hear it um i suppose and i'm and i have the book here and i because i I love to quote things that are said. I'm one of those people that um, is big into that. Um, I suppose there was something here that stood out to me in the book when I was reading it. Um, and it was around your not getting attached to outcomes, um, I suppose. And, and I suppose that's really prevalent when we look at, and, and I, I love the story you, you talked about, and I suppose I've I've done a little bit of mentoring with startups, and you talked about a startup, um, and you know that it was going really well, and then it, you know, they just ran out of money for whatever reason, and you you'd lost that position, and then they turned out the business didn't take off in the end, and they weren't patient enough, and and um hadn't given it. I suppose the proper time that it needed and um, hadn't really been probably strategic in planning, you know, um, I suppose the, the, the business needs um, in order to, to drive it forward. But um, I suppose, because you have a couple of scenarios there in the book where you talked about outcomes and they didn't really get you what it was you needed. What if, what was it kind of, I suppose, one of the biggest learnings you've taken from your professional career where you may be focused on the outcomes a little bit more and um, that maybe you learned that the outcome wasn't really I suppose the result that you needed it was more so the journey that you needed in that particular um, company you worked for. Mm, yeah good one so I think that definitely is slow and steady wins the race you know if everyone's kind of rushing towards an outcome or getting to where we all think we want to get to you know, you're going to lose sight of things along the way. And in that particular instance, yeah, I mean, slow and steady and patience and, and, and persistence would have been better off. It was a finance problem that can happen. But equally, I think that you've got to be in it for the long haul um, and enjoy the journey. You know, I think that we're all looking for the final, final destination. But I guess the outcome of that has taught me to be a little bit more prudent about, you know, who I get involved with. So there's a learning for me there, too. You know, I mean, you know, everybody says we have a great culture, we have the best, you know, tasting alcohol liquid, you know, we're well financed. You know, so now I ask more questions about it. Well, how are you financed? And so on and so forth. So that's a learning for me. But, you know, slow and steady wins the race. You know, sales business is fast and furious, but it's slow and steady. It always has been and always will be. You got to be patient. You got to stay the course. You got to learn to pivot. You got to be open and honest to feedback. You got to accept if things aren't going well. That's cool. That's where we're at, you know, and then do an inventory of what you can do to, to do better and move forward. So uh, I've certainly learned a lot along the way in my 23 years of sales. <laughs> yeah, it was really interesting because I, I was reading in the book and, and um, you know, you spoke about how you worked in a franchise um, mm -hmm. business in Ireland. And that was a very hands on role. And you really got to see it, I suppose, 
from an implementation level within the within the retail side of things um, and also from you know the buy-in end and all of that and you're really involved in that whole process and then you went on to, to work in, in a huge um I think it was Heineken and one of the mm-hmm. larger scale businesses and obviously the way we do business over here is different um I've worked for French companies and I've worked for Dutch brands okay so I know the Irish way is a little bit different okay um and that takes a little bit getting used to you know so and I think in the book you touched on this a little bit and I think for anyone that's listening um you know and that has worked maybe or bought as a consumer in an American store versus buying as a consumer in an Irish store it's very much a different experience service wise okay um so I suppose the, the question is because I was reading about you know your relationship building skills and sales obviously you know slow and steady we get to know the person and then we, we bring in the business side of it and um, did you find that a hard adjustment over in America because there seems to be more and you touched on this the direct approach and maybe the softly softly approach the uh let's get to know uh John there uh do you know he knows Mary and you know this kind of whole thing that happens in Ireland because it's smaller um h- how did you adjust to that because it must have been a bit of a, a shock in a way yeah 100 percent. I definitely had to kind of fit in like it's no matter where you go in any country you know there is an element of fitting in with whatever the culture is without losing sight of who you are and your own personality and your values which we spoke about before but yeah no, I needed to get to the point straight away in a lot of meetings you know and um, people are busy busy but we're all busy aren't we but we all have only 24 hours in the day anyway you know but I could quickly see that a lot of people didn't know a lot about each other people who've been working with each other for 20 plus years which would be totally alien in Ireland you know when you see the same people every day that you wouldn't know too much about them so after a while I was able to bring in my own personality the Irishness of course the storytelling and the personable nature which all Irish people have and people really liked that it was authentic you know if you remembered you know daughter's communion or just basic stuff and it wasn't you know genuinely not doing it from a salesy point of view I wanted to get to know people so what do you do you ask questions you know any vacation coming up it's always a tough question for Americans because they don't take vacation and they kind of look at you oh, why would I go on vacation and then you start talking about where they'd love to go on their buckle list but after a while then I got the right blend you know so but I think that's more understanding your customers too you know so some are you know be brief and be gone give me the facts the data and go away other people want to talk about sport all day long but it is tricky, you know, you're in the meeting and, and you you kind of you can see body language from people. They want you to move on or so on and so forth. So, yeah, you have to adapt. I mean, the great thing is we all speak English here. I mean, I don't know how people move to other countries in fairness to France. You know, I know that English is, is, is well spoken or, or Japan or Asia. And um, that's got to be very difficult, too, you know, but um, you have to fit in. You know, you got to get with whatever the ethics is, but then you must bring out your own personality. OK, and you must be authentic to yourself. Don't change for anyone but try to blend it in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I read one of your stories. It was really interesting. You were in a boardroom um, mm. and uh, things didn't go to plan at all. Um, and someone had you given up a report and you hadn't delivered the report yet. And you would notice that um, by yeah. being kept on in that meeting by accident that the reports were shared. Um, Mm -hmm. Talk me through that because that's quite a tough situation to be in in the workplace. Um, Mm -hmm. I suppose, how how did you feel? How did you navigate that? Because it must have been a lot of emotion going through you having seen someone take your work and say it was theirs to then not actually respond or react to that. Yeah, um, Well, the great thing is that having worked in sales in the corporate world for 22 years, yeah. in one way it wasn't kind of surprising. But when something like that happens to anyone or to me, it yeah. hasn't happened before. But people taking credit, I mean, I'd always give credit to other people that were involved in a project with me. Well, why wouldn't you? But that's okay. That's everyone. Everyone is different. But that particular meeting, yeah, it was a big board meeting. And, and mm. you know, I kind of knew something was up a couple of days beforehand. It was... Um, it was just a funny environment but to, you know shout out to all the board members they asked me to stay in the room because the documents had been shared the previous day so therefore they had got sight of them and I guess that is the pivotal moment because had I left the boardroom 
the person who was presenting was going to be speaking about me, claiming my work was their work, even though it's team effort, but I was the point person and also making recommendations and making changes to my career and my position. So when that started happening, you know, you could see definitely the person presenting knew that, uh oh, <laughs> she's in fairness, she just kept, ran with her script and um, the board members backed me up and, and she left the business quite quickly after that, you know, so they supported me. I got the vote of confidence. However, like I do think what would have happened had I left the room and walked in, not knowing really what was happening and I would have been going through my presentation and then for however it worked out, I mean, that could have been personally very um, traumatic. You know, I would, I would have had to um, really draw on my experience of saying it's not me, it's someone else's issue. But I was fuming, to be honest, you know, I was, uh, even though I kept my composure in the meeting and, 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 get, and rebuked all the things that were incorrect because you have to stand on your own two feet. Why would you cower away from somebody when it's not factual? So it was an interesting one. Again, another learning for me. There you go. That's life, you know. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really important. And I think you've mentioned a few times your values and staying mm. through to them, but also having a voice. Um, I think you mentioned that having a, a voice in that meeting to be able to say that to those people. And it sounded like like reading the rest of it, it, it really worked out well because you stood up for yourself in a really well, a really well professional way that later won the, the buy-in from those other board members. Yeah, no, I definitely like, I mean, look, I, I say there's times in life when you sink or swim and sometimes you might choose to sink and say, you know, I'll let this go. It's not a big deal, you know, but this was major, you know, so you swim and, and you speak up and I, look, I, I learned from a great manager in Heineken and Cork. Um, he taught me so much um, that, you know, he probably gave me the confidence back then when I was uh, a young man and now later in life. Yeah. I mean, if you can back things up factually, why wouldn't you stand up and, and rebuke any negative things, you know, so anybody listening here, you know, you have to have your own voice, find your own voice and trust yourself and have your own values. For me, it's respect and integrity. That can mean different things to different people, but there was a lack of respect and a lack of integrity and I absolutely won't stand for that, you know, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. We move on is, from it. <laughs> is it quite different um, built in those relationships? I think you touched on in the book, um, it's how you do business over there is quite different to over here. And I think you mentioned that you bring people out for golfing trips and you, you take them, you know, away and it's, it's quite different to how it's done over here in Ireland. Um, talk me through that. So like, it, it just sounds amazing to be honest with you, but I suppose in, in kind of in that format, is it, is it needed because, there isn't that personable approach normally. Um, so in order to get to that point over there, you need to take them out. Is that mm -hmm. kind of why that happens maybe or? Yeah, no, you, you've hit the nail on the head. Like you, this is a great chance to spend five hours on a golf course with someone. It's something that I love to do. And it's something that all generally all my customers and distributors do anyway. And they want to get out of the office and, um, you know, there's definitely a big difference between here and Ireland. I think that if if um, the Oireachtas Committee were investigating some American invoices like RTE, but definitely be shut down a long time ago. But everything is accounted for, of course. But there isn't the problem spending ten thousand dollars, you know, on a day of days of God, day of golf for two two three good customers. It's a bigger picture plan. We're talking about business over the next two years, and generally when I play golf with all these folks I'm, I'm quite a good golfer so obviously I'll, I'll help them with their games but we won't talk business this is the weird thing about it I mean we're, we're just you know getting to know each other having fun uh, you you really do see a person's character on a golf course uh, how they behave you know how they interact when they hit a bad shot a good shot you know and they're all so grateful to get out for four or five hours and of course we'll all probably you know follow up a couple of days later after the game of golf hey you know by the way we've got a big distribution drive coming up next month you know, this, can we execute at 90% or whatever we're doing? And it's all that relationship building. It's, it's deepening the relationships. And I've seen other people go out in the golf course and on the first tee, like a coworker of mine be straight in there. So like, you know, what's happening with sales? Why aren't you guys delivering for us? And I'm like, relax, relax, you know, slow and steady. Let's enjoy ourselves. And that's the personable nature then. And you separate yourself then from competition too. But in Ireland, yeah, we did some of that stuff too, but we all kind of knew each other. So in Ireland, I would never... You, you, you would dare not follow through for a customer in Ireland because you see the person in super value at the weekend or you might see him at mass on a Sunday or 
be up at the GA pitch. So, you know, that's a different type of selling too, you know. So um, it's a different mix. But at the end of the day, if you're providing a good service and you're you're solving a problem for customers, everybody will do business with you. You've just got to find your own style. Mm. Yeah, I was, um, there was, a, and you, you literally, it was funny that you said there, you always follow through because there's, I, I underlined this um, and it's funny because it, it's something my own dad says and my own grandmother said, and I don't know if it's, if it's an Irish thing, if it's what, but you wrote here in the book, um, my father and mother instilled in me a good work ethic, not necessarily hard work, but to be conscientious, customer centric and reliable. If you can't do something, say you can't do it. And if you say you'll do something, follow through. And there's been many times where I have had things happen and I said, oh, I can't. Did you say they did you say you do it for them, Louise? And I said, Yeah. Well, you better hadn't do it then, hadn't you? And your arms and legs could be falling off, Andrew. But if you said you're gonna do it in our house, by God, are you gonna do it? <laughs> so I read that and I literally underlined it. And if you say you'll do something, follow through. So that is something that I resonated with. Um, you know, and, and it's interesting because you said it there, and I think. That is something that, you know, regardless, you know, we might do things sometimes for the first time and it mightn't be the best in the world because we're still learning, but you've done it, you kept your word. And I think that's something that will always, always come back um, from a professional perspective um, and keeping your word from personal. I think it's, I think it's really, really important um and, and it's really important to build those relationships that way um and I just loved that even for someone to take that advice in from a business perspective that you know and I think you mentioned the book you know you under you know you under promise and over deliver and you know we'd always say that you know we can we get the order out we go not sure we'll try you know um and then we'll go freaking better get it out you know we'll surprise them and they might get it the day before you know but you kind of just in case there might be an issue with the you know the logistics you'll be like oh okay so um I totally get that from, from a from a business perspective so I thought it was great there was really good questions on the book here and I thought that um when you're working for the you're working for a company and you worked for a lot of companies and um, mm -hmm. you've a lot of experience in the um the beverage sector side of things and um you're working for Mike's Hard Lemonade and you you shared something which I thought was really really interesting for anyone that is in a new role or getting to build maybe the B2B side with maybe their clients or going into meetings. And what you mentioned here, which I thought was a really key learning point was, I set about to understand their business by asking the open questions. How do you look at your business and what gaps do you see? Brilliant question. What kinds of communication style do you prefer? What are key times during the year for your business? What suppliers are you doing good business with you and why? And what have you as a company not done well? What have we as a company been doing well that could further enhance? And I just thought they were really great questions um, because they get to the point, they get to the problem, you know, they get to the real nitty gritty. Um, and I just thought that was a really, really interesting point um, that you touched on there within the within working for that, for that brand. Um, I suppose... When did you get to that point that those kind of because you did mention further on that you know you had little things happen and um, did you do a course did you how did you learn that like what came about you asking those great questions you know did you read a book the kind of you know what I need to be approaching this differently how did you I suppose self learn that skill because many of us take a long time to figure that out um, and many of us might be have our own business we mightn't be around people to give us that feedback Andrew so how how did you come about learning that combination of stuff really was one being open to learning from other senior people in, in whatever profession you're in people that have years of experience to sit with them and talk to them and ask them you know what's a really great customer call what's a great way to uncover information uh, I've been very lucky to get great training courses at Heineken 
but equally when I went back to college in the, in the CIT, which is now the, the Munster Technological University in Cork, um, on the night courses, I went there, we were talking a lot about questioning role play, you know, find a friend, find a buddy, you know, sit down, talk in front of each other, ask them, how do you deliver, you know, are these good questions, try and stay away from getting yes and no answers, or use them at the right times, you know, how, what, when, they're the best questions. And then go practice it, like I just said, find somebody to work with, and then trial and error, you got to go do it yourself. So like all these customers I meet, I get 30 minutes and the next supplier is coming in and the next supplier and they're all saying the same thing pretty much just in a different accent or a different way. But, you know, most people are very anxious. I got to get my information out. I got to use this PowerPoint slide. I got to make sure. No, you just got to ask questions and listen. And then your next meeting, the customer, you heard me. Oh, Andrew listened and heard. So there's a difference between listening and hearing. And then you tailor make your presentation. So you know, Louise, you like to look at that data this way. You like to do this. Perfect. Here you go. And now you're getting in as a partner, not just seeing it as a transactional relationship. So anybody looking to improve their skills, find somebody, practice with them. You know, nowadays, go on plenty of YouTube videos on how to ask great questions or buy a good book. <laughs> Maybe the answers are in, in a book that's called How Did I Get Here? But yeah, no, look, practice, 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 no matter what it is. And, and uh, don't be afraid of making a fool of yourself, you know? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think from talking to people and even people that have service-based business or product-based businesses that people don't buy in one interaction. Um, statistically, from business development managers could have up to 10 to 15 interactions before they close that sale. So it's like what you said, it's it's gathering. You're, you're that investigator. You're going to put on your little investigator hat and you're now going to find those clues to see what that customer really wants and what excites them, um, you know, uh, and makes them feel good. So I think it's, it's a really important point to touch on because I think some people do get really bogged down in, you know, the transactional piece of it. And I think the humanistic side of it, I think, was lost a little bit in COVID because, we, you know, we, you could, I think in some places, anyways, you couldn't use cash. It was card and they didn't want to touch anyone, you know, ooh, you know, um, and I get that it was a big, you know, everyone was afraid to even, you know, stand near someone. But I think it's funny how that has like, it's gone, but it hasn't in service-based industries. We're still a little bit standoffish, you know? So I think it's, it's about reconnecting again with people, like you said, and asking those questions because you want to get to know the person behind the actual um the sale you know and, and people connect to that yeah um you have your little boy um yes. god it was very heartbreaking reading the the last part of the book um with with the the miscarriages and all of that and I think um probably it's not a lot of men speak about it from what I can see Andrew I think um you know I think that they were bringing in leave days for for in in Ireland for men and um, where the where the they had a miscarriage with, with the with the mom and the dad so it, it is something that we don't see spoken about and it was nice that you spoke about that in the book and you shared that kind of vulnerability and the the you know, from, from a male perspective, um, as well as, you know, knowing it from a female perspective was really, really nice to hear. Um, you have your boy now, um, and and it's it's wonderful. And I and I loved reading the I loved reading the, you know, you, you stayed at home and you're around when he walked his first couple of steps and, and you could feel that emotion um when you got to that part of the book, um, where that was probably a really, really tough time for you guys. Um, to, to get through that but to keep going I suppose um, Andrew and to keep working through it which I thought was unbelievable because you know it's, it's a lot of miscarriage to, to keep going and, and continuing on on that reflecting back is there anything that you would have done differently now I know he's talked about maybe slowing down a little bit I think he said one of them the doctor said to just work your way through it which I thought was a bit for God's sake, you know what I mean? I was kind of reading it going, are you for real? You know, um, I wasn't happy reading that part because I just thought it was, um, it, it, it lacked compassion, I think, um, yeah. and definitely. Um, but is there anything looking back on that where, you know, I suppose you've said, you know what, I kind of wish, any, anything you wish you'd done differently, I suppose, or you've learned from that experience um, that you kind of, you kept going, did you find, 
did you go to therapy did anything kind of support you in that process or um how did you get through it so yeah we had four miscarriages in four years all in america and each one totally different and but equally devastating as as much as it was great news when Jane found out she was pregnant and uh, we just never got past, you know, the first trimester, even the yeah. night before the 12 week scan, but all went well. And our son Alfie was born. He's going to be four in a couple of weeks time. So um, happy days. He's my hero. He's James hero. But I think definitely, yeah, no, we didn't go to therapy. We definitely leaned on each other an awful lot and we did throw ourselves into work, which, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that to be honest, you know, because you start compensating, you know, working long hours, distracting yourself. And I definitely think we probably should have involved more people. You know, we were a little bit too stoic. Um, first time, fair enough. You know, you kind of keep it to yourself. Second time, you know, third time, fourth time. But I, that could have been the Irishness in us too, a little bit to not want, not to share. Uh, and I suppose we were living abroad. So kind of in our own minds, you know, we don't want to be worrying anybody back in Ireland. What can they do? But there is great comfort in talking about things. And, um, you know, we could have done. A lot more of that too now we did lean on each other an awful lot there was plenty of times when we cried and plenty of times we hugged and plenty of times when we were frustrated with each other too honestly you know or you know short with each other or whatever that term would be but you know we kept hoping that things would work out we looked at adoption and IVF, and you know we didn't have problems getting pregnant but you know we're not citizens at that time so we couldn't adopt anyway so um it all worked out well however we had kind of reconciled that if it wasn't to work out you know, that we'd, we'd have to find some other way of being parents, you know, I mean, so, or we just have to accept it. And I think that there's a few stages in grief and we were grieving and we were both on different spectrums, you know, it's not straight shot one to five or what, how many steps, mm. but, you know, anybody going through anything, not necessarily miscarriage, like if you have a partner or, uh, you know, uh, you, should, you have to, you have to speak, hey, this is, I'm not feeling well today, not I want to talk about this. God almighty, folks, we got to be a little bit vulnerable, you know, because we all, have feelings we all have emotions and it's better to get them out of your head if you can and if you can't do that with your partner find a therapist you know go speak you know i mean it doesn't have to be costly just access to services so on and so forth like um but again you have to stay hopeful things will work out you know and, and then you got to trust back yourself too you know so yeah. it's worked out um but you know going back to uh what we were talking about with sales and all that kind of thing you know people don't, don't do things the first time around same as Alfie I can't get him to eat broccoli so I tried I, I read something about you got to get a kid to try food five times before they like it and now he likes broccoli <laughs> so we did give up we didn't give up on that but you know it's uh there's always something that you can do different and um you know the book the book starts with you know a health scare but ends on a great note with Alfie being born too you know and it's a it's a nice book 219 pages 23 chapters four sections and some hopefully some experience that I can share with people um the book really is a legacy for my son Alfie I want him to know where we came from and uh, all the royalties from the book go into his account and that's it that's him his account and whatever happens with that the book will live forever I won't live forever not find, sounding morbid but that's a fact you know and uh, I'm 45 years of age the first 45 has been interesting so we'll see what the next 45 will be like but I'm here I'm here to help anybody talk to anybody help people through things my buddies have opened up to me about many different things mm. um, I've had females reaching out to me about their stories of miscarriage and other things and people are talking and resilience is, is, is within all of us we said at this, the top of the conversation we do have the power to overcome things so you can figure it out yourself or you can involve people but if you trust yourself and you back yourself, you know when the right time is to involve people. And, um, you know, it's, um, you get a lot out of it by talking about it and clearing, clearing the decks and go and have some fun then too, you know. Um, yeah. There's nothing that can't be overcome, you know. I mean, just find a way, communicate. Yeah. And, 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 and good stuff will happen, I promise. Yeah, I love it. And, and how did I get here? Hashtag keep going. You know what I mean? Because that's what yeah. keeps coming up in each one of your stories. It's just this keep going. And, you know, we talk about resilience sometimes in coaching, like, you know, like a bouncy mm. ball and the ball bounces back. And I think it's, it's when we bounce back, you know, that bounce back ability, when we do get that knock back, how do we bounce back again? You know, it's how long we stay back there to how long we come back into it and then how we move forward from that. So um, 
I just thought it was fantastic. Um, really, really great stories in it. I think um, from a personal or a professional perspective, people will relate. Um, I've a good few of them highlighted there, which I'm going to pop a couple of them, just the key ones underneath and the, the book as well. I'll have a link for that for anyone underneath as well. Um, it's been really, really great chatting with you, Andrew. Um, if people want to reach out to you, mm. where would you like them to reach out to you on? Is it LinkedIn? is it where what's platform are you on mostly or where would you like yeah so well you find me on linkedin andrew fitzgerald as my title there is a global beverage expert and international best-selling author which is a new title since february Amazing. and then my website is www.andrewfitzgeraldauthor.com you can buy the book there you'll get a signed copy if you buy it through there but you know if you want to bundle the book with other items you order from amazon and let's try and support some independent businesses so call it to any independent bookstore and ask them for how did I get here by Andrew Fitzgerald and they can order it. So we don't have worldwide distribution. So uh, I hope that everybody enjoys it and gets something out of it. If they like it, fantastic. And if it's not for them, please just pass it on to someone else. That's all. Thank you so much, Andrew. It has been a delight to have you on. Um, I really appreciate your time. Please check Andrew out. Um, he's absolutely amazing. The book, again, How Did I Get Here? Um, really great, all about resilience. Um, there's some amazing stories there. So check it out. There'll be links underneath. And as Andrew said, support local if you can. Go into those local stores and order it there. Thank you so much, Andrew. Great. Thanks, Louise. Take care.